before today's event, how many of you had heard of Smart Beginnings? Can you raise your hand? Oh, that's a beautiful thing. Good. Okay. Because, you know, we, we try to do a lot of public awareness, but we're not ever really for sure how much of that trickles down to the school level. So that's good to know. Thank you. Um, sometimes we're confused with a preschool program or a child care center, which we're not. We really are about systems change. We're about working with the individuals and the organizations like yourself that already serve children zero to five and looking at ways that we work together at, at the highest level of collaboration possible. We're one of 29 school readiness, um, school readiness initiatives in the state of Virginia um, that's sort of funded and administ uh, administered by the Virginia Early Childhood Foundation in Richmond. Our mission is to ensure that each and every child in Danville and Pennsylvania County is ready for success in kindergarten and in life. And we, again, we work with individuals and organizations serving children from birth to five to ensure that we have ready children, ready families, ready schools, and ready communities. And so as I think many of you have heard, we have this amazing opportunity. The Danville Regional Foundation publishes their community report card, as many of you know. One of the main categories on that report card is education, and it's hard not to notice that uh, the city of Danville has the fifth lowest performance on PALS-K, which is that pre-literacy assessment that I'm sure most of you all are familiar with. So it draws attention to PALS-K, and the Danville Regional Foundation says, how can we make that better? So they put their heads together with um, a lot of school readiness folks across the state, uh, we developed a proposal, and starting last January, it was funded. Some of you may or may not know that some of the schools, almost half of the children coming to kindergarten are not ready to read. So the Danville Regional Foundation invests five and a half million dollars over five years. And we've just finished our five, so we have our first year, so we have four to go. Um, this really is a unique window of opportunity. I'm not sure if, if, if everyone really understands that in Virginia, the school readiness investment by the state is about one and a half million to serve the entire state. We are one of two well-funded school readiness initiatives in the state. Lots of communities don't have Smart Beginnings coalitions and most do not have this kind of funding. When we received the award, not only was it the single largest investment ever made in school readiness in Virginia, we got calls from the Wall Street Journal, from senators as far away from California. Uh, and not to be dramatic, but the world is watching. You know, we live in an economy now where there are a lot of cuts, and we, we have to have some successes because we need local, state, and federal governments to invest in this period of life, zero to five, that you never get back. And we need you to make that happen. And so what are our goals? We have lots of goals. We have lots of short, midterm, interim objectives. I'm not going to get into all of that. But what is DRF in part paying us to do? What are our big deliverables? I want you to know um, that 95% of all children entering kindergarten will score at or above benchmark on PALS-K. We know it's not a perfect ex uh, assessment. It doesn't look at all things. It does look specifically at pre-literacy. But in Virginia, where 99% of public schools use this assessment, it is a, conven a convenient and a legitimate way to evaluate one component of school readiness. Uh, we've also, we also know that you, you want to leverage any gains that you make in pre-literacy and that the real turning point is at third grade. You know, you're reading to learn until third grade and then you're learn, uh, reading to learn. So that 100% of children will pass third grade reading SOL. We know this is lofty, and honestly, these were not our goals. Our goals were a little bit lower. Um, but in, in the vein of taking this journey with you and supporting you in your work, these are the goals that the federal government has set for you. And we thought, well, we can't have goals that are lower than the goals that you're facing. So um, we're, we're in this together. We're here to help. OK, so we have lots of strategies to reach those goals. Probably one of the most important is just to simply raise awareness about the importance of a child's intellectual, physical, and social and emotional development before age five. If we do nothing else other than make sure that people understand this is not a period where, where children just, you know, you stick them here or there and they're, being, they're going to babysitters and this, that, and the other, but in fact that 85% of a child's critical thinking skills are developed by age five. 
And for those of you who are parents or aunts or caretakers, you probably know this. You, you probably know that those things you noticed before age five about a child's personality, their approach to learning, their social skills, a lot of that just doesn't change. So we have our work cut out for us. There's a lot of people that just simply don't know. Those are probably the parents I care the most about. Those who just don't know any better and know how important this period of, of time really is. Because from kindergarten on, you're really just playing catch up. So another strategy, create neighborhood-based access to evidence-based parent education. All parents need support. All parents need guidance. Some people are really blessed. They have great in-laws or aunts or cousins or neighbors who've modeled what that looks like, or maybe they're avid readers. But to go through that journey without any kind of guidance uh, is, a, is a strange one and probably not going to be as, as good as it can be. And we know that all parent education is not created equal. So we've looked to other states. And what we've learned is that the Incredible Years is an evidence-based parent education program that not only is wildly successful, that, but that parents are excited about. After two or three classes, they, they come back without incentives. So we'll launch this fall in four neighborhood-based sites. And we hope to continue to grow that program to serve as many parents who are willing to take advantage of that. To improve access to high quality child care. All child care is not created equal. And as each of you in this room know, child care is a tough business. I don't care if it's a baby, a one, a two, a three, or a four. It's not the highest paying job. It can be very stressful. It could be very rewarding. But this is an industry of women and men that absolutely deserve our support. They need professional development opportunities. They need networking opportunities. They need our support, and so that's a big part of what we do. And there's a brochure that will tell you a little bit about the Virginia Star Quality Initiative, where like other states, we are now rating child care centers, and probably more important than the rating at this point is that for those child care centers that are participating, they're getting 18 months of um, mentoring by a professional mentor, that one-on-one -on -one coach. Increasing support for professional development opportunities working with young children. As I said, another one of our strategies, we've created the Early Childhood Educators Collaborative. We meet four times a year, and that's really open to any individual that's working with, serving, caring for young children that wants to be with other like people um, and wants access to those training opportunities. I think one of the most interesting um, trainings that we did last year was to offer pre-K PALS training to the child care centers who have kind of been left out of that conversation. And they're eager and they're excited and enthusiastic and they're really embracing that. They're, they're so committed now to learning more about pre-literacy and some of the strategies that are working. And equally exciting are the kindergarten teachers and the school system folk who've come to the table and said, let us show you what we know. So they've come to our training and they've modeled pre-literacy activities that work for our child care providers. It's very exciting to see when that type of alignment and support occurs between the child care providers and the school systems. Um, not this year, but probably next, we'll also be offering evidence-based, uh, neighborhood-based playgroups for children zero to three. This is a model that was created in Washington that we're very interested in. We know that maternal depression can play, uh, uh, wreak havoc on a young child. And one of the ways to do that is to get those mothers and fathers who maybe feel isolated out into these play groups. We know that they have to be neighborhood based. These are for those parents or grandparents for whatever reason that they're staying at home. To get them out, get them feeling supported. And then there's a trained facilitator that really models for them um, how to resolve complex, uh, uh, resolve social conflicts, how to interact with babies. Again, all these things that some people know naturally, but not everybody does. Um, school readiness camps. Last year we offered our first school readiness camp at Grove Park. Um, we learned a lot. We had funding for 150 slots for children who had no prior uh, preschool experience, and we had 27 children. And it was not for a lack of trying, you know. What we learned is that the, the, the families that had kept their children home had kept them home for a reason, and convincing them even to come to sort of a last-ditch school readiness camp before kindergarten began was not any easier at the end than it had been probably for the four years that other folks had talked to those families about 
um, participating in some type of preschool program. Um, here's what, what we learned that's interesting. So we did have 27 kids, and I have to give great thanks to the health department and DSS and the housing authority and the community services board who really went door to door and found the families, found these kids who had no prior preschool experience who really, really needed to be there. And we saw measurable gains. We spent four weeks with these children, and I have no doubt in my mind that these kids went to school the first day of kindergarten with a degree of confidence that they didn't have before. Um, and I'm hoping that the kindergarten teachers also enjoyed um, perhaps a child that was more ready for school who, based on our experience at the camp, probably would not have had that experience the first day. Although, let me go back and say this about these school readiness camps. There's not a lot of research in this area. There's a lot of talk. We don't really know for sure yet what works best. We don't know if it's a three-day, if there's much of a difference between a week-long intervention or a four-week-long intervention. You can't undo five years in four weeks. So we're, we're working with some national leaders in the field to really determine, okay, we know we need to do some version of this, but we don't know exactly what, and we want to use the money that we have right now very wisely. So if you have any interest or experience in this area and want to be a part of that, um, please let us know. We also want to increase collaboration between families, child care providers, elementary schools, and service providers to ensure smooth transition to kindergarten. This event today is about that, the, the school readiness piece, the school transition piece. We're going to be working very hard over the next couple of months to increase enrollment and early kindergarten registration. We also know that home visiting, and in particular evidence-based home visiting programs such as Healthy Families, which is a very strong program here, is hands down probably the, one of the very best ways to transform a high-risk family. In this scenario, a healthy family's home visitor, very well trained, um, is working with that mother and that new baby as young as six weeks. And that's a relationship that maintains over the next four to five years. Um, the, the, the data that comes out of that tells us that is a very successful way to not only prepare children for school, but to really help that mother, empower that mother, um, stop additional unplanned pregnancies and lots of other really good things. It's, it's a very expensive way to do it. So while we have doubled capacity, um, it's, it's not something in this community yet that we, that we know how we could really take to scale. I will tell you, um, in Hampton, Virginia, they so believed in the home visiting model that they took it to scale. And every mother has, has the option to have a healthy family's home visiting, um, or home visitor if she's qualified. So that's kind of exciting. Um, the other thing, again, in the vein of systems building and doing the very best we can with what we already have because this money will go away, we cannot just fund interventions, programs, and strategies. We're working very hard to get to know each and every one of you and the organizations that you're with to uncover and make sure, are we using the resources that we have? There are federal and state dollars that trickle in in different ways to help children zero to five. Are we really collaborating as much as we can? Are we really doing this the best way possible and putting our heads together? I think that our board is a reflection of that. The, the, the board um, for Smart Beginnings is made up of both superintendents, the director of the health department, the directors of social services, the directors of Head Start. It really is representative of all the system level leaders who have the ability to change policy and to move money around. So it's, it's kind of exciting. And again, we don't want to just really stop at kindergarten. We know that the journey continues. So one of our most significant strategies for making sure we maintain gains is to make sure that for every child that's eligible, that we find a qualified volunteer that's willing to be a book buddy and, and maintain that relationship first, second, sometimes even all the way through to third grade. So I can't really talk about strategies without talking about partners because, again, everything we do is so highly dependent upon the well-being and the interests of our partners. Um, business leaders, local employers, city and county government, including Parks and Rec, the libraries, Danville Public Schools, the Regional Foundation, the Community Services Board, the Health Department, the hospital, the faith-based community, Head Start, licensed child care providers and family care homes, 
other organizations serving young families, the Science Museum, the Arts and History Museum, Parents, Pennsylvania County School, the Redevelopment and Housing Authority, Social Services, the United Way, the Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, and you. And I know that's a long list, but every single person and every single organization on that list matters so much. We will not be successful if we're not fully engaged with these partners. And I hope what it says to you today, you know, when we talk about a ready child, a ready family, a ready school, ready community, you know, what is ready community? Well, to me, it's very exciting that this morning here to greet you, to show support to you for this journey, is the chairman of the County Board of Supervisors, the both of the superintendents, the president of the hospital, the director of the health department, a judge, a bank president, a mayor, and faith-based leaders all here to this morning to come and greet you and to let you know that they want to be a part of this as well. Okay. So it's a lot of information, I know, but it's exciting. And so what's next? This really is the official kickoff of our countdown to kindergarten. We want as many children as possible to register early for kindergarten this year. Why? We know that it helps you to plan, but it's even bigger than that. To us, when a, child, when a parent or a family takes the time to register early for kindergarten, we know that that's a sign that it's starting to catch on, that people are hearing about school readiness, that they're thinking about kindergarten. So for us, it's actually a pretty important measure of whether or not parents are starting to think more about uh, getting ready for school. It's, it's also this huge opportunity for us now if more and more parents register in March, or at least by the end of April for kindergarten, this critical six-month window that we talk about, all these different ideas for building relationships with families, well, now we have their names and their phone numbers. It's a practical matter. It just really makes the work a lot easier than just trying to reach out to the general public. So what exactly will that look like? Our marketing blitz will begin February 1st. You'll see print ads, radio ads, television ads, utility flyers, really frankly any way we can think of to get the word out. I hope that you all will leave today with your t-shirts and wear them often. Wear them to Walmart so that when you're standing in line, that new mother's reading that list of the top 10 ways you can start thinking about school readiness. We'll go before the Pennsylvania County Board of Supervisors and City Council and ask them to proclaim March School Readiness Month. And you might ask, well, why March? Well, again, because we want families to start thinking about kindergarten not a week, not a day before the first day of school, but many, many months in advance. And I hope that you'll join us. I hope to see as many of you as possible come before the County Board of Supervisors and the City Council wearing your t-shirts. We'll have an event at the YMCA where all of our partners will set up tables and again we'll just be talking and talking and talking to families about how to get ready for school, how to be ready for kindergarten. And for the first time ever, I'm pleased to announce that again in the vein of systems building and collaboration, the city and county will kick off kindergarten registration on the first, the same day. So March 16th, start spreading the word. March 16th is the first day you can go to your local elementary school and register for kindergarten. Okay, so how I want to wrap this up, and probably the most important thing I can say to you today, which is really a reiteration of what um, Jason has talked about, is that relationships are so powerful. I mean, we can talk about stuff to do and things to do, but the most effect that any of us will have on families is the way that we treat each other and the way that those interactions take place. Um, Every time you take a phone call, return a phone call, see a parent, reach out to a parent, you are making an impression, some sort of impression. And a positive impression is the very first step to a relationship. And if you're one of those people who says, I don't know, I'm just not good at that, I'm not good at networking, I'm not good at relationships, yeah, you are. Because you just have to ask yourself, how do I want to be treated? And think about the way it makes you feel when someone smiles or goes out of their way to find information for you, or just to be nice. I know how hard all of you work, and I know that this is very tough business dealing with families and young children, but it's just so important, especially in our community where we have such high poverty, 
high unemployment and such high risk. Um, okay, so again, that's really probably the most important thing I can say to you. If you wonder about your ability or think you don't have enough time or it costs too much money, if you do nothing else, pay very close attention to the way you will, the way that you build relationships. So let me shift uh, for a second to talk about why, why would we focus so much of our energy and time on this particular transition, given how many there are out there. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with how important and critical this period of time is for, for learning and development for kids. And the fact that uh, when we poll several thousand kindergarten teachers a couple of years ago, uh, there's a pretty large chunk who think that kids are coming in and adjusting successfully to that kindergarten classroom. But there are a good number of children who are having some or quite a few problems making that adjustment. So it's a, a relatively large chunk of kids um, entering who are having difficulty with things like, yes, uh, basic uh, early academic skills with uh, reading and math, but also doing things like following directions, uh, being able to kind of regulate themselves, and begin to be able to relate and, and socialize with other children their age. <clears throat> um, another reason that there's a lot of concern about this period is that uh, when you look at national studies, this is a, a study that was done by the um, uh, by, the, by the federal government, uh, where they followed children uh, at, from the beginning of going into kindergarten and beyond. And uh, what you see here is um, the light colored blocks um, show children who are coming from families where mothers have less than a high school education. Um, so these are families that are a little bit less resourced than others. And the darker the blocks get, these are uh, families in which uh, parents have more education. And so what you're seeing is that children are, who are uh, less, coming from less resourced families, um, no fewer letters, are having trouble with beginning sounds in comparison to their more resourced um, counterparts. And that's true um, in reading and math. And it's also true in some of the early uh, social development pieces, um, such as making friends and being persistent and, and being um, eager to, to learn. Now the reason that this is most concerning is the fact that when you follow these children through elementary school, um, what you see is uh, kids who have a lot of risk early, and that would be the, the green line, um, when they come in the fall kindergarten are doing quite a good, bit worse on reading um, than those who uh, aren't having as many risk factors, the blue line. And as you follow them through time, you see that the gap becomes bigger. So um, what we're noticing is that it's not that kids are coming into kindergarten and then um, elementary school is actually helping them catch up, but in fact, uh, what we're seeing is that they're diverging in ways that's really concerning so that by third grade, you see this gap between kids who are coming in with risk factors and those who aren't that basically stays stable through the, the rest of their K-12 through career. And so uh, this is true of both reading and math, uh, and so it makes a lot of sense for us to be thinking about how to improve the adjustment during this period of time that's really critical um, so that we can uh, begin to try to, to uh, stop this gap from widening through the elementary school period. So that sets the stage for why we're focusing on this particular period. Uh, and then the question is, so what do we do about it? What ought to we be, uh, how should we be rallying our resources to support kids and families? And, how we think about what's most important during the transition uh, is going to inform what things we decide to do. And so I think uh, up until the last couple years, um, a lot of folks have been thinking about the transition mainly as a very child-focused view. So thinking about the fact that prior to elementary school, uh, we need to help children uh, develop as many of these readiness skills uh, as we can. So whether that's knowing their letters, being able to sound out particular parts of words, count things, that if we can help them have those skills, um, they're going to throw them on a bus and send them to kindergarten. As long as they have those skills, they'll be, they'll be fine, right? Uh, and there's no doubt that that's a huge part of being ready for kindergarten. But what I'd like for you to think about today is that the transition is not just child-centered, okay? It's not just all about that child having skills. But in fact, um, children are 
uh, developing within the system of care that involves neighborhoods and schools and families and peers. Uh, and these uh, systems of care connect with each other as well in ways that can either deter or support how well children are developing those skills as they move into kindergarten. And so if all we do is focus on particularly helping a child get those skills and take them with them, we're missing lots of opportunities um, for creating a smooth adjustment for kids. Yeah. Um, so as I talk further about um, the best practices for kindergarten transition, um, I'm thinking more about this, uh, this sort of web of resources around connections around a child through the transition period. This actually fits really well um, with the school readiness definition that Virginia put out uh, a year or two ago now, uh, where there is a, a large emphasis on ready children, um, but there's also an emphasis on producing ready families, ready schools, as well as ready communities. The downside to this is it, this wouldn't be a problem if all those things were really well connected to each other in the first place and there was stability, but unfortunately, um, one of the reasons why this transition is so difficult for kids and families is that there are a lot of changes that are happening. And so you've got pretty significant changes sometimes in the demands, the academic demands that are being placed on children and the types of activities and routines that they're being asked to experience coming from either their home and home care or from some sort of early care, preschool or pre-K experience. <clears throat> Also think about, from a child's perspective, how much more complex an elementary school is um, than either a house with some siblings or even some of the preschool, Head Start, pre-K places that they're coming from. Uh, they're going into a place where there are many, many more adults that they have to figure out how to navigate with and certainly peers from various numbers of ages. Um, going to a cafeteria in which you have children from lots of different ages and different people. So it's a very complex social environment uh, that they're having to navigate. We've done a number of studies where we've gone out and asked parents about their experiences during the transition and, and there's one theme about them wanting and perhaps missing some relationships with um, the major players at school. And so this parent is talking about you know, wanting to um, really get a little bit more closely connected in an interactive way um, with the school because it's a place that her son's spending a ton of time and so she really wants to, to make that happen. Uh, there's also another theme around information sharing. Uh, this parent had uh, a less positive experience around information sharing where um, they weren't really sure whether they should send a child to kindergarten because of the age being on, sort of on the cutoff. Um, and so the information they got back was simply that your child's way behind, they shouldn't have shown up at school. Uh, so you can see that um, information here can either be um, helpful or it can actually kind of deter the relationships that are being built between families and, uh, and schools. So some of the, the common themes from parents is that um, this idea that when they do get information and contact from schools, it can be really helpful. Um, so another quote I didn't put up there is that a phone call that a parent received a week before school from a teacher that was just reassuring and, and helped to connect things versus the quote that I showed you uh, where information was a little bit late in coming about the, the child's preparedness for, for school. And so it can, can be harmful or it can help. The other major theme from parents is that they prefer to be helped in thinking about this transition earlier in time. So rather than the week before, the day before uh, kindergarten actually starting, thinking about it even earlier than that, a year or so prior. So, as you're thinking about what you're already doing, um, either personally or in connection with the other people in this room, be thinking about this broader view of the transition, that it's not just a kid taking a bunch of skills with them through time, but that they are interacting with teachers and parents and peers and community members and neighborhoods, and that those are really valuable resources that need to stay connected um, as kids and families are moving from early care into the elementary school experience. Um, and the, and as many practices as you can come up with to strengthen those, those connections, the better kids are going to be um, as they're adjusting to, to kindergarten.